Okay, so I am going to give it back to McFinn, but before I do, just so everybody knows, we're going to do a little bit of a different format today. We're going to have two guest speakers, so we're going to have two Q&As. So if at any point during the presentations you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. My name is James, and I'm going to hand it back over to a man you know all so well, McFinn. Folks, we're trying to get to know you just as well, and that's why we meet here every two weeks. It's like an extended family with the same concerns. A lot of times when you grow up, your family separates and goes their way. But this family has something really in common. And that's that each of us has an experience that just might help someone else. Because ALS is a trial and we're all being tested. And it's our attitude that we take with us every day that will see us through this. So if you can, please see all the people that are here tonight joining you and realize you are never alone and that each of us has a purpose and your purpose is unfolding right in front of you. I'm not sure what it is, but I know that everyone is more than you seem. So watch out for your purpose and grab it when you can and share it endlessly. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mira. Great. Thank you so much, McFinn. That's such a beautiful thing. And I, I just love the way you approach this. And I'm so glad that we have such a strong team of advocates like McFinn. Um, and I want to start off by saying we have some really exciting updates for you. So for our agenda today, we will start off with our data scientists from Everything ALS, where we're going to talk to you about the latest and greatest in our speech study. We're also going to try to recruit some of you because um, we would like you to be in the study because we really want to push to get to that um, point where we can submit for digital biomarkers. This is going to be so helpful for, for ALS in, 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 in its entirety. Um, and so we need your help. Um, so without, and then we'll go after we talk a little bit about our speech study updates and then how to get involved in the speech study, we're going to move on with um, really exciting talks from um, a, another startup company that, that is really focused on prevention and falls. And we have Dr. Tameo here to talk to us, but we'll, we'll go into more detail soon. So without further ado, we have our data scientist from Everything ALS. His name is Alan Tates. He has this PhD in neuroscience of speech processing, and he has some really exciting things to update you on. So um, without further ado, here's Alan. Thank you a lot, Mira, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Nice to see you. I know we don't have much time, so I will go directly to sharing my presentation for today so I can update you on the things that we have been working on the analysis. Um, so, well, as uh, Mira said, uh, my name is Alan Tides and I am leading the data science team from Everything ALS. Um, the work that I'm going to present today, I have been working with uh, Julian Peller. Today he wasn't uh, able to join. And uh, as you probably know, we're working on the search for speech-based based, uh, digital biomarkers. Um, so um, let me tell you a little bit about the goal of our research. We have as a short-term goal, um, we want to build a, basically a progression tracking algorithm that can assess the speech deterioration uh, on patients with ALS. So we want basically to build a, a reliable and objective scale that uh, help us have a, a score um, from, from speech that is objective and not subjective. It, this will help us uh, continue, uh, to continue studying the, the disease. As a long-term goal, of course, we want to find biomarkers that will help us early diagnosing the disease. And building this progression tracking algorithm is the first step towards this um, objective. So um, the data that we're working on uh, is the 
is the data that you are helping us uh, collect. And we have over 600 participants. Uh, you probably know some of the speech tasks that uh, we ask you to, to repeat. Uh, the pataka utterance, uh, sustaining the vowel, the bamboo passage. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, today, I'm going to talk about the pataka task and the bamboo walls. Um, at some other time, we may talk about the other tasks. And I'm going to start uh, telling you how we analyze the video um, that we record. We, we, we record both video and speech. And this is a video of me uh, saying the bamboo passage. And for this, um, what we do is we use a landmark mesh uh, with a software that can help us track the position of the different articulators on time. So from each video, uh, we uh, each video has a, a, is a sequence of frames and from each frame we can get the position of different articulators and then we can build a time series with the different positions of the uh, different articulators. For example, um, we can see the, the, the shape of the mouth on time. This is called the mouth aspect ratio. We can also see the, asp the eye aspect ratio, which is the, the size and the shape of the eye on time. And so we can convert a video to something a little bit more easy for us to analyze, which is this, uh, this different time series. Um, so basically what we do is, um, as I was saying, from the video we, ex we extract every frame and from every frame, which is basically a, a picture, we find uh, uh, the position of the articulators with the landmark mesh. Um, from there, we extract this time series um, that we call them features. And with that, uh, this is where it gets a little bit more technical and please stop me if uh, something is not clear, but we train what is called a statistical model. Uh, this is called machine learning and it help us uh, basically, basically building a statistical model that finds the pattern on this time series to uh, identify different um, um, well, to identify the different patterns to help us um, predict a specific goal. For example, um, one goal that we have, uh, as I was saying, is to make a regression to get the ALSFRS score. This is the speech score that that you report uh, after every other, uh, after every task. And and this uh, model can help us find the patterns for, um, for making this prediction. Um, another task that we have been working on is uh, classifying between symptomatic patients and controls. And these uh, statistical models also uh, help us in distinguishing between these two groups. This is thinking on the long-term future for building these uh, early diagnosis algorithms. So uh, I'm going to show, for example, a few results of, of this approach that I was saying. Um, for example, if we use from this bit, from the video, we use uh, what we call the mouth features. This is only the positions of the lips on time. We can train models that predict with an 80% accuracy, almost 80%, 79% accuracy, uh, can predict between the controls and symptomatic patients. This is done if we, if we use the Pataka task. If we use the bamboo passage, the accuracy drops a little bit to 74%, um, but it is worth noting that we can do this only with the video. We haven't started using the, the audio yet. Um, using this approach, we can also predict, as I was saying, the speech subscore that goes from zero to four or from one to four. 
and uh, we do this with a relative error of around uh, 15 percent uh, for the for the speech subscore um, this is uh, actually quite uh, encouraging because um, this shows us that we are on the on the right direction to continue building this uh, this algorithm um, I think I have a few more minutes to to tell you how we analyze the audio for analyzing the audio uh, the audio is basically this uh, time series uh, we can convert it to what is called a spectrogram a spectrogram is shown right here is this image so every um, so every utterance we can cut, uh, trim it in chunks and every chunk we can convert it to this spectrogram the spectrogram tells us uh, on an image uh, which frequencies are present on this chunk of audio and here we also train a statistical model that it's called a neural network you probably have heard of it they are uh, now very well known because they are very powerful so with this spectrogram we can train the neural networks to either again predict or um, or distinguish between controls and symptomatic patients or we can train them to uh, predict uh, again a speech subscore and um, so we we have been using them for both and we saw that the accuracy for classifying between controls and patients uh, increased by a lot by using this method so it, it increased to 89 percent which is quite high um, and we also used it for um, for doing the speech subscore prediction uh, and now the relative error dropped a little bit uh, we, we are still running experiments on this uh, we are still testing so we don't have the, the the final relative error this is a little bit premature but I wanted to show you some results uh, and again the results are a little bit better than uh, with than analyzing only the video um, again this is uh, encouraging to tell us that we can actually predict this using only the audio finally um, there is a, another approach that we are using that is very simple that is a uh, trimming specific words from the bamboo passage uh, words such as create flower most or getting and only by uh, looking at the speaking rate um, of these um, of these words and this is basically the duration of these words we can also predict with a very good um, accuracy the um, the ALSFRS speech subscore so that's about it I know I don't have much more time uh, but I think we are we're fine on on it please if you have some questions I think there's some time later for them Perfect. Actually, Alan, we're going to talk a little bit about why what you said is so important, then we'll move into questions for the speech study. So um, now what we're going to do is, is tell you why this study is, is so important that we have more participants. In order for Alan and his data science team to come up with these results, we really need to compare them to pals to people living with ALS because we really need to, we would like to make this something that can track clinical progression, something that we can use instead of that ALS FRSR score. I know we all don't like that subjective testing. And so we want to make this a quantitative um, analysis so that you don't have to do an ALS FRS score. And, and in order to get to that point, we really need your participation in the speech study. Um, what we really want to do is we want to increase the longitudinal results, meaning we want participants living with ALS to be in the study for a longer period of time. So before we would ask for weekly sessions, but what we find, what we found is that, you know, 
maybe we're asking for too much. So really the core of what we need is one session every single month for at least five months. This will give us sufficient data to, to allow our, our really smart team members come up with the things that they need to come up with. Um, Alan and his team would be so appreciative of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to demo how exactly to register in the speech study. So I'm going to let James take the wheel for now. Thank you, Mira. I'm going to share my screen real quick and uh, we'll just give you a quick step-by-step -step on how easy it is to sign up. So as always, everything starts by just simply going to everythingals.org. Up this little tab here, if you hover over research, ALS speech study, that's where you want to go. Simply click on it, log in and register, whether you've already done your Puttika sessions or if you're new, just click the login and register. Now, at the very bottom here, if you're going to be brand new, new user, sign up, new account, that's where you want to go. Click it. And we're just going to kind of pseudo go through one right now. Our email for the day is going to be ending ALS together at gmail.com. And we're just going to call this ending ALS, our account name for short. Make up a little password here. James, you have to tell us your password now. <laughs> I'll tell you, I got it off of the coffee mug that's next to my desk. <laughs> and then once you fill in all of those things, simply create new account. And I'm going to add a, an exclamation point at the end of that one. Because we take our privacy here seriously. All right. Let it think. And there we go. So now that we're registered, I'll have to log into the email and do that. Um, and then once we go through that, I'm going to stop sharing it for just a second so I can do that. Um, while I pull that up for just a second. We're going to try to watch for his coffee mug in the meantime. <laughs> I got it on vacation. So I'll give you that much of a clue. So I'm going to... I'm gonna actually gonna show you what the email looks like um, that you get. So I'm logged in there right now. So you'll get this email and you'll simply wanna click the clicking here sign, click the registration, log back in again with the same email that we have. And I understand that that email looks a little bit fishy. There's no everything ALS logo. That's an automated process that we can't change, but that is from us about this study. So please don't spam it and go ahead and click on that link. And so James is going to take us to the next step. Right. And just as a, as a heads up, it shouldn't go into your spam folder, but I would say if you don't get the registration email within two minutes, just double check to see if it's somehow gotten there anyway. So once you get this is the, the welcome page, you're going to want to add yourself as a new user. And what's important about this to note is that if you have multiple people in your family who are trying to do this, first, we would recommend everyone signing with their own email, but you definitely want to have one person per user. It's very important for the data. We're just going to fill this out real quick. It's a simple questionnaire. I am over 18. <laughs> Uh, it's a very important to know that right now uh, you need to be uh, living in the United States uh, in order to participate. So that's a, a big thing just to make double check and make sure. Uh, and then you'll have this signed up. If you have multiple users on the same email, everyone will have its own unique little square here. Our always read through the fine print. I've done this before. So we're just going to say that I have read this. So the next part is the um, consent form, which she's just taking you through. And then after this, you'll be able to fill in a little bit of an intake form. Um, and we won't have to do that right now, but that is important for us to have all of the data in one place. And then from there, you can start your unique sessions. And I'm going to start um, sharing my screen where I'm actually going to go through um, for people that are already in our study. Um, it's going to be a little bit more exciting because we've revamped the website in addition to revamping our study. Um, and now, you know, it'll be exciting with some confetti. It'll have a map of the date. So you'll be able to track 
where exactly, um, when exactly you did your sessions. Did I do it in August? Did I, you know, do I need to do it again? If you want to give us more data um, on every two weeks or, or something, um, sure, go ahead. We just don't want you to get burnt out. And so one time a month is our basic ask of you. And it might just be easy for you to do that on the first of the month or the first week of the month. We're going to have new reminder emails that are going to come out to you for this. But in addition to that, you can start your session right here and you can update your profile right here. Something that's really great about everything ALS is that we are pairing each of the participants up with a student ambassador. And these students are coming from college and they're so excited to help in any way possible. Um, if you have any questions at all, you'll be able to reach out to them um, and, and help uh, get any help that you need. Like, hey, I can't sign on. Hey, my computer won't sign on. Those are just my issues, uh, but you might have better issues at hand. So. Um, We'd love to see you in our speech study and it would really help our team out. Um, from here, we can move on to some of our questions that you guys had for Alan and the data science team or you know about the speech study in general. So um, James, I'll let you take the lead from here. Sure, and I see that Alan's been answering some in the chat, but um, there's a few I wanna ask that weren't in the chat. Um, Alan, could you give us just kind of a little bit of a, of a preview or a synopsis what is the data showing for those who have or who are experiencing deteriorating speech? Sorry, can, can you repeat once again? James? Sure, sure. I sure, I know it's an ongoing study, but as of right now, can you give a little summary of what the data is showing for those who have or are experiencing deteriorating speech? Oh, I see, yes, of course. Um, well, on the video side of things, uh, the, the analysis showed a different, uh, basically, lip movement. We've been analyzing the, the movements of the mouth, and we see that there is some uh, type of asymmetrical movement on the, on the mouth. This is a different in the velocities of the left side and in the right side. So this, this creates some, some type of... Uh, um, asymmetry between the, the, the two sides sometimes. Uh, we also see um, that the acceleration of the lips is uh, lowers a little bit on time as the as the disease progresses. Um, this is this is of course not surprising. We we know that the the, the disease affects the the strength of the muscles. And if you remember some physics from, from high school, actually the acceleration is basically the same than strength. So we do see these, uh, the, the, the best features that we have for doing these predictions are using the accelerations of the, of the mouth. On the audio side, what we see is a, a lower a speaking rate and, and also velocities of, of speaking on, on time and some other uh, technical features from, from speech that are called uh, sh uh, shimmer and jitter and some other very specific, there are acoustic features that uh, change a little bit on, on time. But that's basically what, what we see. That's very interesting. I, I want to introduce also one of our student ambassadors, Bella. I'm going to have her ask the next question as well. Hi, I'm Bella. It's so nice to meet you all. And I'm so happy to be here today. Um, uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm a senior at USC. I'm studying pre-medicine and um, specifically human biology. So it's been really great working with everything ALS. I feel like I've learned so much. And as McFinn said earlier, it truly is um, ex like an extended family. So yes, I'm really grateful for that. Um, so one of the questions that was asked was with with the progressive deterioration of speech over time, could you determine the progression of disease? So did you account for the progression in patients who are taking different medications? Well, that, that's basically, that's a, that's a great question. And that's, that is something still uh, to be studied. And that's basically the idea. Uh, this, uh, 
I mean, this scale, what is so important to have a, an objective and reliable scale um, is because that can help uh, the, the drug companies to track the progression and see how, how much uh, each uh, drug uh, actually helps and which one it doesn't. So this is why for us, our first uh, um, goal is to build this reliable scale that today it doesn't really exist. This this is not uh, what we have is not as reliable as an actual objective measure. And um, so yes, that, that's a good question. That, that would be the, the idea. And then I'll ask the, the final question for the speech today and we'll move on to our second part. Um, how did you select the specific words for the speech study? Uh, were there words that didn't work and why? That's also a very good question. And we've been working on this for some time and we have been uh, doing uh, our guesses from, from phonological, from a phonological study that we, that we do. There, there are some phonemies that require different types of uh, vocal tract efforts um, and some sequence of phonemies that require a lot of effort. And we thought those were going to be the words that were going to show the bigger differences. But it turns out that they weren't. Um, and we are not sure why yet, but uh, we did. We, we first guessed we, it was our hypothesis we saw that they didn't work as well and we did the other way around. We started exper experimenting with all the words and we selected the ones that worked the best for, for doing this task that we wanted, which was predicting the, the, the speech subscore. And the ones that we are showing are the ones that turn out to be the, the best ones for, for, pre for this prediction. Uh, we still don't understand why. This is, th these are kind of uh, new results from last week. Uh, but I do think it's uh, interesting to see that uh, uh, our hypothesis in this case wasn't wasn't true, and and we have other other words that we were thinking of. I, this is incredible. You know, I've worked with the speech study for a while, and this is the first time I've kind of got to see the behind the scenes and our, our results. So this was ex extremely exciting. And for those of you who may not be able to see the chat, just to echo Mira, if you have any other questions about the speech study for us, please feel free to reach out and ask them. We will get back to you with, with an answer for you. Um, Mira, I'm going to give this uh, back on over to you if you want to end anything on this. No, no, no. It's all you. Let's go ahead and introduce our next exciting speakers for the ALS uh, Expert Talk Series. James, Perfect. take it away. Perfect. Thank you. And Alan, thank you once again for joining. We're going to switch gears here a little bit uh, with Dr. Nina Tameo. I hope I'm pronouncing your, your last name correctly. If I'm not, please feel free to correct me. I'm going to give a little biography here. Uh, at Prev AI, we believe that they believe that homes should grow with us, and just as our lives change, so should our homes. Uh, Prev AI are a 100% virtual fall prevention program harnessing computer vision and AI linked to a network of trained clinicians to provide personalized in home fall prevention, rapid access to comfortable home equipment, and action strategies to prevent falls. Nina Carmela R. Tomeo, DOMS MPH, is a board certified spinal cord injury trained physical medicine and rehabilitation physician. Dr. Tomeo brings her expertise and passion for neuro rehabilitation with a special focus on spinal cord, stroke, brain injury, and neurodegenerative conditions as chief clinical officer of Prev AI. She is also passionate about accessibility and universal design, community integration for people with disabilities and healthcare technology. Dr. Tomeo hopes to improve quality access and delivery of rehabilitation services by leveraging AI assistive tech and bridge gaps in the transition to home process. Her work at Prev AI contributes to her dream of a more universally designed and inclusive world. And with that being said, I would like to welcome to the forum, Dr. Nina Tomeo. Let me see if we can find her. Uh, James, do you mind unmuting her? Sure. We got it. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes perfectly. Hi. Hi. Thank you for joining. Hi. No, thank you for uh, the invite. Um, 
You got the first half of my name correct. It's actually Dr. Tamayo. Ah, the um, second pronunciation. So, yes, Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> In the Philippines, we don't really have an A. Everything is a very hard A. Ah, so Tamayo. So yeah, just a little, you know, factoid there. Um, but I'm trying to figure out how I can share my screen with you guys to start my presentation. Sure, let, um, me, let me get you there for one second, and okay. now you should be able to do so. Okay. Share screen. I think this is the one. Okay. Um. Okay. So Prev AI is coming up with some really neat uh, AI technology to help with virtual falls. Um, while while Nina is getting that loaded, James, will you create a co-host for either Samir Sood or James Taylor so they sure, can? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. All right, James, I got you there. And. So Prev AI is a team of doctors that have come together to, to tell you a little bit about more um, how falls really create a health problem. Um, and they're coming up with creative solutions to help with your virtual falls risk at home. And so what we're doing is we're trying to bridge that gap and help you in any way possible to give you all of the relevant and useful information possible. So I might have James Taylor or Dr. James Taylor or Dr. Samir Sood talk a little bit more about that. I only have James Taylor. I, I don't see Samir. James, were you able to add Samir Sood as a co-host? Yeah, I'm just Samir. Not, I'm, not, Samir. I'm not seeing him in the participant window. I might just be missing him. I do have my glasses on, but sometimes they still fail. <laughs> It'll just be Samir. Oh, there, there you go. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Co-host now. <laughs> I would love to see James um, sitting there. Um, so Nina, do you want me to, to share my screen so you can um, just talk off of my windows here? I, th I think we actually lost Nina connection-wise. Well, I'll try sharing for now. Is Nina still on this call? Just do the fucking presentation. And when she pops back on, I'll, I'll get her back on. Um, all right. Um, well, I guess I can try to start here. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll talk about the, the background here. So we are a virtual solution to eliminating barriers and preventing falls. Um, our goals are not just to kind of fall proof a home. We're really looking to bring accessibility, function, style and comfort. We, we do not want to make homes look like hospitals. We really want to make them feel comfortable, feel dignified. Um, and that is our goal here. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is not me. Um, hmm. Well, uh, so, so Nina is um, a, a great physician. She's a spinal um, cord specialist. Um, she works in skilled nursing facilities, long-term care facilities. Um, she is very passionate about travel and disability medicine, so how to enable um, patients and folks of all types to be able to travel on all the trips they want to. And then, of course, she's our, um, oh, she is fall prevention um, specialist here at uh, Prev.ai. I think she just rejoined. Nina, are you with us? Yeah, I'm going to get her right back on here.
keep going here. Um, <clears throat> so Nina is a physiatrist, um, otherwise known as a physical medicine rehabilitation um, physician. So she uh, and doctors like her emphasize prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation um, of people disabled by disease, disorder, or injury. Um, hey, hey, Samir. They use a multidisciplinary approach to focus on every aspect of their life, including uh, their role in the workplace, home, and everyday activities. And lastly, they focus treatment on maximizing physical function, fostering independence, and improved quality of life. I see Nina laughing at me because I'm probably butchering <laughs> her talk here. Nina, would you like to take over um, from sure. here? And I'll I'll keep uh, just I'll just move through your slides as as you need to. That's fine. Um, I know I appreciate that. Muted, just uh, yeah. Am I still muted? Or no, you're, you're good. We can hear you loud and okay. clear. Okay. Okay. All no, right. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So. Um, Sorry about that, guys. I had a little malfunction with my computer. So um, anyway, it seems like Samir has done a very good job of explaining what a physiatrist is. Um, but basically, I know that most of you may not, uh, or I don't know if most, but uh, some of you may not be familiar with what we do. Um, and our goal is really uh, to restore function. So we are the functional doctors. Uh, we are the ones that try to get you back to your, your life. Um, and to get back to the activities that you um, like to do after, um, you know, a diagnosis of a spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, or in this case, ALS. Okay, next slide. Um, so basically, to kind of go into that a little bit more, um, we look at what we call intrinsic or ent extrinsic factors that create, you know, our form and structure. Um, so there's personal factors, those are your intrinsic factors, um, things that are uh, non-modifiable generally, and then there's the extrinsic factors, which are your modifiable factors. And we look at those and how they influence each other and how that affects our function and our quality of life. So some of the questions that we like to ask, sorry, go back, um, is you know, how, do, how do these affect how we function at home? Um, and within our community. And that really looks into our activities of daily living and our independent activities of daily living. How do these affect our ability to stay as independent as possible? And what types of technology and adaptive devices exist to help us with what we call in rehab, our new normal. And that new normal can affect everybody. Um, so it's not just people with disabilities, but it's also the elderly, you know, as we age, uh, I think every decade we tend to, um, you know, face a new normal. Um, so it's something that we like to ask. Next slide. So part of the reason why I, I've joined PREV is that to me, it's really an extension of rehab. It isn't just for the elderly. It isn't just for people with disabilities. It's for everyone. And so today, um, while I know we kind of talked about how PREV uh, focuses on the fall prevention space, I'm actually going to be talking about universal design and uh, home accessibility and why these are such important topics to discuss, because it is actually part of our work at PREV. Next slide. So tonight's agenda, um, I'm going to discuss some current trends, which I think are pretty interesting, um, and sort of their, uh, the, the movement towards universal design and accessibility review the definition of these terms, discuss why they're so important and why a home without barriers is so important and provide guidance on uh, how Prev, Prev AI can help all of you. And uh, we'll, we're gonna wrap that up with a, a quick interview with one of our six super users, uh, James, uh, who I can see I think is here tonight. So, yay, okay, hi there. All right. So some interesting things to consider. Um, next slide. So the world is not actually made for people with disabilities. And this is why I have a job. <laughs> and uh, the good thing is, though, that things are starting to change. Um, because of this, you know, unfortunately, there's been a view that having a disability is considered abnormal. Um, but it's only because the world makes it so. Uh, this is, you know, as I said, changing. And some of these images that I'm going to show you, um, this is actually from my work in travel and disability. And the world is really starting to listen and there have been initiatives to improve um, and highlight these issues. So for example, in these three uh, pictures, uh, there's, these are some news articles that talk about the travel industry. And you know, there's plenty of people with disabilities who have wheelchairs and um, how you know, they get destroyed, especially during travel. Uh, there was a recent New York Times article about a gentleman who kind of described the humiliation he goes through 
when he travels through the airport or on an airplane and having to describe to somebody just how to transfer themselves. So there's increased reporting of these kinds of issues. Um, and so we know that there's been, there's this movement towards addressing the plight of people with disabilities and hopefully change our world to allow them to function. Um, okay, next slide. So I, I included this more for you know humor's sake, but it's also kind of really sad because these are uh, memes that have showed up on uh, the internet and social media. These are some of my favorite hashtag accessibility fails. Uh, clearly, you know, the people who made these ramps uh, were not thinking about people with disabilities. It was, uh, you know, done sort of as an afterthought. So um, I, I just put this for, for your, your pleasure. So let's move on. Uh, the second trend is that, uh, you know, the, we are really getting older and we're living longer. Um, next slide. And uh, I want you guys to pay attention to these um, uh, charts on the right side of the screen. So on the x-axis, um, you know, you'll have uh, basically the population in millions and the y-axis is the age and group. So this actually harkens back to my public health uh, school days uh, where we looked at tons of these charts and sort of the trends in population growth. So as you can see, 1950, we had more, um, you know, children and not really a whole lot of um, older people uh, past the age of 65. So Samir, if you can just move through the, the second slide and then stop at the third slide, I think the chart sort of explains itself. So by at least these charts sort of stop at 2030, but you can see we're starting to grow older and there's more of us. Um, so there's an increasing number of people with multiple comorbidities. Um, and, you know, that means that, you know, we're, we're going to have to deal with uh, different kinds of illnesses and changes in function as that happens. Uh, the interesting thing is the AARP uh, did a quick study showing that 87% of adults age 65 plus want to stay in their current home and community as they age. So there's this growing trend of uh, more older people being in uh, on this planet. So there's a need for education um, uh, with various disease process to ensure the safety in the home and to make sure that they age in place successfully. Next slide. And the third trend is that, uh, as I mentioned, sort of on um, you know part one of these uh, trends is that there's a new movement to increase accessibility in the built environment. I'm gonna talk about a few of these things. So the first part is New York City. Um, we're seeing this in, in different parts of New York City, but I think the one that has uh, gotten the most um, uh, attention recently is that uh, they're trying to completely rehaul and renovate the New York City subway system. Uh, most people know that if you've gone to New York, it's not that accessible for people with wheelchairs or just people with uh, mobility impairments. Um, and so there's been a, an initiative to increase the number of accessible subway stations uh, to 74. Um, there's also uh, works towards uh, renovating the elevators uh, and improving street access to subway stations, uh, adding accessible telephone booths. So if you need any help while you're in the subway, uh, it's actually going to be ADA or accessible uh, for people with disabilities. Um, they're also looking to include more accessible ticket stations and even toilets. Uh, so it's a massive movement in New York. So I'm really curious to see how this is gonna, gonna look in the, in the near future. Um, the next one, next slide, is that um, you know, there is a movement towards more accessible tourism uh, that's really been um, moved or, or pushed by the United Nations. Um, so for those of you interested in traveling, again, this kind of comes from my, my work in travel and disability, remember that not every country has a law like the American Disabilities Act, um, but there is a list that the UN kind of put together um, where they requested uh, multiple countries if they were interested in signing what we call the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And this means that they have a version of the ADA or they have policies or initiatives that work towards protecting the rights of people with disabilities. Um, in addition to that, the 2030 Agenda uh, for uh, Global Action 
uh, continuing the sustainable development goals includes a focus on principles to quote, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And this basically calls for provisions of universal design for accessible and sustainable transport systems, inclusive urbanization, and um, access to uh, greener spaces. Next slide. And then within the architecture and design community, there's uh, work towards creating uh, more accessible spaces to promote greater autonomy for people with disabilities. I think with seeing the chart that you know I showed you earlier, there's definitely a move towards um, even uh, creating homes that are um, more uh, inclusive for the elderly. Um, and the increasing need for this aging population as well. Um, oh, I don't know what happened to my slides. I'm not sure, I'll keep talking. Um, but uh, basically there's goals to improve performance of our activities of daily living without the need for help from others. Um, and it's now being ensconced in architectural design principles. Uh, and in addition, with the rise of assistive technology, uh, the built environment and home spaces can even be more accessible to everyone. Um, there's a push to build um, residencies that are more welcoming, uh, modern and stylish, and they're now really focusing on uh, materials and aesthetics. So uh, the pictures here are actually from an accessible, fully accessible home. So your house does not have to look like an uh, like a hospital, which I think is one of the fears that um, most people with disabilities have. So uh, what I'm trying to show here is that there are options and we can truly make your house your home and not a hospital, um, especially with whatever disease process you might have. Next slide. So the last bit is something called the visibility movement in housing development. So this is actually a little bit separate from the ideas of universal design and um, accessibility. So uh, this was actually started in 1986 by Eleanor Smith. And the goal is um, it's, it's actually more for new home construction. And it refers to a single family or owner occupied um, housing that's designed in such a way that it can be lived in or visited by, that's why visitability, uh, visited by people who have trouble with steps or who use wheelchairs or walkers. Um, and it really has three main principles. Um, the first one is that it has to have one zero, zero step entrance. Um, and you know, for any of the six uh, super users who may be here, you know, that's one of the things that we looked at um, in terms of your entryway. Um, and you know, I'm sure you 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 may notice the uh, the uh, doors. We also measure the um, the width of the doors. I know James even brought his measuring stick out with his son when <laughs> we did his uh, his uh, walkthrough. Uh, so that's very important, having a, a, a minimum of 32 inches to get through um, a door. And then there has to be one bathroom on the main floor um, that you can get into with a wheelchair. So there are these really important trends to improve accessibility pretty much across the board, both locally in the United States and globally. Next slide. And of course, the last trend I would like to highlight is specific to ALS. Um, and, you know, I think we're looking at it from a rehab standpoint, of course, you all might know more about this than I do, um, but certainly from an assistive tech and medical standpoint, I think there have been um, many advancements, um, you know, to allow people to live longer. Um, so next slide. And so I think that there's been a shift in um, certain outcome measures for ALS from survival to function. And, you know, you guys were talking about the uh, ALS functional rating scale earlier. Um, you know, there's now sort of increasing longevity with this disease. So we're really focusing on function from a rehab standpoint. Next slide. And because of that, uh, we're seeing, even though it's still the gold standard um, in disability progression, um, some of the studies that I've read, um, you know, the ALS functional rating scale sort of now is facing new changes and adaptations to consider what's kind of going on and to really consider the different ALS clinical subgroups. Um, so next slide. So, you know, um, now that we've kind of gone through those trends, 
um, let's actually take a look at the definitions of accessible de design and universal design, because believe it or not, they're actually different, uh, but most of the time they are um, used interchangeably. Next slide. So accessible design is a design process in which the needs of people with disabilities are specifically considered. And we're going to go through some of those examples later. Um, so accessibility sometimes refers to uh, the characteristic that products, services, and facilities can be independently used by people with a variety of disabilities. Universal design, on the other hand, is a much broader term. So accessible design is specific to people with disabilities. Universal design is basically, you know, a design um, uh, philosophy where uh, products and environments can be used by all people to the greatest extent. And the, the goal here is that there is no need for adaptation or specialized design. So accessible design is actually within universal design in a lot of ways. Um, an example of universal design, or let me back up here. So having a sidewalk with curb cuts is an accessible design principle. What makes it universally designed is if you pair that sidewalk with a door that automatically opens. So then it benefits not just people with disabilities, but parents with baby strollers, delivery workers, and others. So if that sort of makes sense for you, um, you know, that's, that's kind of how the two work together and how the two are also very different. Um, next slide. So I'm not gonna go through all of these principles because there's a lot of them, um, but these are the seven principles of universal design. Um, and uh, the, the main point here is that uh, all seven of these principles taking into account body fit, comfort, wellness, um, awareness, um, understanding, social integration, and personalization. Uh, the idea is to incorporate health and wellness into the built environment. Next slide. And I've included this as an example. It's a pictorial of all these seven principles, and it's really for your own review and um, perusal. Um, but basically, the idea is that um, anybody can um, use anything if they're universally designed. So they talk about, you know, scissors here, the handle of a, a door, um, how to get into and out of spaces, um, using a phone, for example. So uh, these are all examples of universal design. Next slide. Accessible design, on the other hand, are actually what really makes it super different is that it's regulated by laws in the US um, and they're geared towards um, inclusivity of people with disabilities. Uh, the ADA, which was signed into uh, law in 1990, um, is perhaps the most comprehensive law that protects people with disabilities. And the codes and standards below, um, you know, this the list of laws here, um, are actually governed by the US Access Board. So all the standards for accessible design are um, ruled by the US Access Board. Um, and these are the guidelines to help um, buildings, homes, um, you know, public spaces uh, to become ADA compatible. Now, I could spend an entire lecture just talking about the ADA because it is a massive law. I'm not going to do that and bore you guys, but uh, these are actually links um, to uh, different laws that uh, help pave the way to the ADA. Um, and it also, I also included the links to the codes and standards. So if you wanted to learn more about it and to understand um, even some of the work that we do at PREV, this would be a good resource for all of you. Next slide. Um, so again, uh, you know, something with accessible design, I'm, I specifically work with people with mobility issues. However, um, you know, the ADA also includes, um, you know, considerations for um, not just people with mobility impairments, but colorblindness, visual impairments, I'm one of those, um, neurodiversity, uh, autism, dyslexia. Um, so those are all included as part of the ADA. Next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna go through some of the examples. Um, accessible design in your home, you'll see they're very specific. There are some overlap, um, but you know, the accessible design looks at you know, your doorways. Here it's 36 inches. It's really 32 inches with a sweep of um, you know, 90 degrees, um, but ideally it should be 36 inches. Uh, pock doors are better than swing doors. Um, roll under countertops, sinks, and cooktops are also better. Um, they also promote uh, the use of wireless control smart home features or voice controlled smart home features. 
Um, Handholds or grab bars in the bathroom are also part of the ADA. Um, cooktops with front mounted controls, because if you think about it, that's safer. You don't want to be reaching over, especially if you've got upper extremity weakness, you don't want to be reaching over a hot stove. Um, and another thing to consider in bathrooms and in bedrooms and even in the kitchen, um, that should actually say and bedrooms, uh, there should be a five foot turning radius in, in all these rooms. Now, universal design is, uh, you know, the concept is a lot more open, no boundaries between rooms without doorways. Uh, there's a no step entry to all of your, um, you know, rooms, uh, rounded corners and multi height countertops, especially in the kitchen or in the study room um, are all part of a universally designed home. Um, a lever handle versus a round door ham handle are also uh, things to consider. Um, lower height light switches. So, you know, this is actually something I did not even think of. I'm four foot 10. So I went to a demonstration unit that actually had all of these universal design components. And I was literally flipping out because I could reach everything. Um, you know, so it was great to see that, you know, one thing I also didn't include here are um, uh, pull down shelves are also considered universally designed. Um, raised electrical outlets, um, for example, you know, when I had my little accident with my computer earlier, I had to like reach down. That's so much harder, you know, to do. And it's even harder if you have a disability. Um, so, you know, again, these are just really great examples of um, both accessible and universal design. Next slide. So why did I talk about all this, right? So going back to what we do at Prev, um, I guess the point here is that everyone deserves a home that adapts their changing needs. Um, you know, it's and it's it's really important to kind of focus on uh, the place that we spend most of our lives in. Um, so you know, we'll talk about next slide. Sorry, the next slide. Uh, you know, why is it important to have a home without barriers? Um, really, you know, again, you know, it's really important to create a home that works for those who live in it. Um, the idea is to address function as we age, but also as we deal with new um, comorbidities, um, address fall prevention uh, strategies, especially with the evolution of disease. Um, having a home without bar barriers also improves your functional independence and quality of life. As a rehab doctor, that's what we want to focus on. Uh, we want to create a sanctuary for you um, to be able to age in place gracefully. Uh, and we really want to give you back control of your life. You know, the diagnosis of ALS is not a modifiable risk factor, but we can address those modifiable risk factors in your life. And that includes your home. Next slide. And, you know, truly, you know, the front end costs of these uh, pay off with long term rewards um, from a rehab, you know, standpoint, you know, I work in skilled nursing facilities and I have seen so many stories of, of people who could have gone back to their homes and avoided the cost of going to a skilled nursing facility or long term care facility if they just had a more accessible home. Um, even from inpatient rehab, that's probably one of the biggest heartaches I have as a spinal cord injury doctor. Um, and, uh, you know, so many of my patients end up in skilled nursing facilities because they can't get up, you know, they can't get into their homes because of the number of steps. Um, they can't fit a power wheelchair in or it's not an open enough space. Um, and truthfully, what most people don't know is having these kinds of accessible um, designs actually raises the value of your home. Um, and also, if, if uh, you kind of going back to those um, uh, charts, the need for accessible housing is on the rise, especially in the travel industry. So if any of you are entrepreneurs, um, come join me and let's, you know, create a, a more universally designed uh, vacation home because it's something that people really look for. Um, so I know some of you are thinking, OK, she's talking about all this universal design and accessibility. But what if, you know, I, you were just recently diagnosed or if uh, you're not physically or mentally ready for something like this? Um, and, you know, if you're scared of making your home look like a hospital or the fact that maybe you can't afford it right now. And honestly, that's OK. Um, you know, our goal is to educate help you understand uh, these modifications as improving your ability to function and maintain your independence. And truthfully, we just want you to consider the possibilities. We want your house to be your home, and it certainly doesn't have, have to look like a hospital. These are also all examples of 
universally designed or accessible homes. Um, and they look great. You know, I would want to live in one of these places. Uh, next slide. So how can Prev AI help you? Um, and these are just some questions that we kind of came up with. Um, again, our goal is to, um, you know, prevent falls, but also to, um, you know, look at the accessibility of your home. Um, but, you know, the questions we ask is, are you ready to consider a more accessible or universally designed home? Would you like guidance on how to make your home safer and prevent falls? And do you have a loved one or you yourself who you'd like to make sure is safe at home? If any of these, you know, questions, um, you know, speak to you and you think that, you know, you're ready um, and you'd like our help, um, we're here for you. Next slide. I mean, yeah, I don't mean to cut you off, yeah. but we are um, running that's short fine. on time. So I might have this to jump actually... to your interview with James. Yeah, that's uh, fine. And um, then we're going to run into a quick Q&A. Um, sure. And James or Samir, if you wanted to answer some of the questions that are already in the chat, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and we appreciate you guys coming on because we, we really want to hear all these updates from Prev. Sure thing. James, are you ready? You got to unmute yourself. Okay, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, go ahead. And uh, so the first question is, before doing a formal home evaluation, did you feel your home was safe and accessible? Yes, because I was um, just diagnosed in March. So um, up until then, we lived here 22 years and we're a very active and athletic family. So we never pay attention to the steps or the doors or the stairs or anything. So when I, I did the interview with you and, and with, with the video, it opened up my eyes to the hazards that we do have around our house. Okay. Were you surprised with anything from our report? Yeah, it was that, you know, things that we've taken for granted. And I'm fortunate right now because I have the ball more. So physically, I'm, I, I still walk, do everything, but um, the stuff in the report that you guys pointed out, or um, some things that my wife and I are now looking at when we remodel, uh, adapting into that. So what did you learn, um, you know, with the evaluation um, and how did it help you? I, I think the biggest part was, um, I think what you said um, about being able to make the home accessible and not look like a hospital, not look different and just still a home and just in there, changing the lights, which is the door handles, stuff that you wouldn't really think about that you guys call that to our attention. Mm -hmm. So would you recommend this process to others? I, I I would because, um, like I said, when you're healthy and you're active, you don't you don't think about this. When you get diagnosed or you just get older, you realize that you know everything's a little bit tougher. So you you have to be ready to adapt to that. And and, and because we've lived here so long. We didn't want to move or have to move. Um, and you were able to show us a lot of the changes we can make that would allow us to stay here. Great. And I guess I skipped my the second to last question, but what did you take away from the process? Do you feel safer, more empowered, more prepared? Um, I, there... I, I feel... Um, more prepared. I don't, um, I, I, you had a slide earlier that when you get diagnosed, you kind of, you don't want to face it, 
no Great. Um, and that's that actually. Thanks so much, James. And, you know, I really enjoyed doing the walkthrough with you. So um, and we're really glad that you got a lot out of our, our evaluation and our report. So right. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Um, and now what we can do is we can um, start the uh, Q&A session for our falls prevention team. So I know that Dr. Sood and Dr. Taylor. Taylor are answering some of the questions in the chat. But if you guys have any questions that warrant to answer, James Zagasar, as you can tell, I'm, there's so many James. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you can go ahead and answer or ask some of the questions. Sure, I got um, Bella with me. We've Bella got I can do that. That'd sure, we got quite a few. Um, I'm going to kick it off with the first question. Bella will help me as well. But the first question is, uh, do you have any specific design suggestions for ALS patients who do not currently have the use of their hands and legs? Yes, and actually the, that's part of... Um, you know, the, uh, my work as a spinal cord injury, cause I work with, uh, tetraplegics quite often. So, um, you know, we, um, with, especially with assistive devices, adaptive equipment, um, my, the clinical team I work with, they're both named Keith. So we've got the Jameses and the Keiths. <laughs> so, um, and I, I see, uh, Keith Jr. here this evening. Um, they're fantastic and they've actually done um, a lot of the home evaluations, it's like their bread and butter. So yes, um, we can absolutely provide that now without having met you and without having your full functional capacity kind of, in, you know, uh, as a report in front of us. Um, I, I don't want to just give, you know, advice willy nilly. So that's why our um, services are also great because it is actually tailored to you specific, specifically. So yeah, but yes, there's lots of things we can do and it's exciting. So Amazing. Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask the second question, which is, are there modifications for use with IK's tech? Oh, um, I think I might uh, punt that to either Samir or to James. You guys can unmute yourselves too. Sorry, what was that question again? Modifications for IGAZE technology? Yes. Co correct. Um, so uh, can you describe that a little further? Sorry. I think what they're looking for is that, for, again, to go back for those who are dependent on using eye gaze, um, is there any type of technology that is incorporated into more of the accessibility field? Oh, I see, I see what you're asking. I'm sorry. I didn't understand you when you first asked, but yes, um, there's a lot of smart tech right now, a lot of the smart, um, you know, homes actually um, incorporate that kind of technology already. Um, so uh, yes, there are various, um, you know, or modifications we can provide for that. Um, I think that's also kind of a newer field in the, uh, you know, within the accessibility, because not a lot of people have smart homes. Um, but, you know, it, I, I do know that it exists. So, um, you know, but it, it's going to take a little time because it depends on what you use it for and how, how much you use it. So it would have to be built into, you know, certain spaces. Um, and so that, that, that does take a little bit of time. I, I think it's just phenomenal even it exists. I'm going to mm -hmm. ask that. I know this question has been asked in the chat, but I'm going to ask it. So if you're watching on YouTube, we can have the answer. Is there and what financial assistance exists to help individuals retrofit their house or apartment or living spaces so that it can be more accessible? Um, so I so I'm based in Ohio, um, and I know that it's uh, a lot of it is state dependent. Um, so I do know that there are um, grants uh, that are available for um, you know making renovations to your home, especially to make it more accessible. Um, so I don't know about the different grants in other states, but also in each county, um, there are, uh, like department of aging or, you know, the department of, um, uh, disabilities, like they, they have 
uh, offices where they can um, help subsidize some of the costs. At least in Ohio, I know that exists. I am not sure about other states, so we'll have to take a look into that. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna go with our next question, um, which is what should people living with ALS look for in stability devices? In, say that again? What should people living with ALS look for in stability devices? Stability devices? Specifically for um, improving like balance, proprioception, um, oh, that is, that is, that is, I just got asked a rehab question. Keith, you want to help me out with this? Um, but, uh, no, I think, uh, if you're looking at, um, uh, exercise equipment. So again, it depends on, um, your functional status, right? Uh, so the things that we look at, yeah. So go ahead, Keith. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a physical therapist by background. And so, um, working with Previ, a lot of what we focus on here is, um, just that, like marrying the function to the to the need. And so as we get more specific with the individual, you know, we did a lot of research in terms of the universal design, but a lot of it comes down to the individual. And when we look at unlocking the true potential with mobility, with accessibility, um, when we get a good background about the individual themselves, then we can actually pair them up with the best and what we always call in rehab, the least restrictive assistive device. Um, and so it really depends on that assessment and what your goals are and what the current limitations are so we can unlock the independence factor. So um, it's a great question and it, there is a lot to dive into, but there's always a device that we look for to improve your independence, whether it's balance, mobility, and accessibility. So yes, there's there's always an answer. It's all about fitting the need with the function. Yeah, and there are actually various balance um, uh, machines uh, that, that are used in different gyms, uh, even in the rehab facility, there's different types of um, you know balance machines. So again, it depends on um, you know how you're you're actually functioning in the moment. Um, cause for example, I know me, like even just a simple, I forget what those are called. It's like the half ball, like moon. Yeah, balls. That's it. Yeah. I can remember the name. Um, it is impossible for me to do cause I did not, you know, um, rehabilitate my ankles too well when I sprained them, but some individuals, even with ALS, um, like I can see James doing very well on that. Um, because he's got great, um, you know, physical function. So, um, you know, I think that's just an example. It's it's retrofitted to that individual. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, this next question uh, for those uh, in general, but really for those who are just starting out looking into retrofitting their house to be more accessible, what in your experience has been the biggest challenge that is faced in terms of space accessibility? Oh, bathrooms. Bathrooms, bathrooms, bathrooms. Um, and also, uh, you know, and I, 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 I say this with, uh, you know, a lot of care, but clutter. Um, you know, those are probably the two, you know, things that uh, I certainly look at when I'm doing a home evaluation. Um, the bathroom is huge because a, a lot of the homes that we have here in the U.S., um, they, you know, were not built for accessible people, you know, uh, in, before. So changing the bathroom is, uh, you know, just even like the space for the shower um, or, you know, like a space for a bathtub, uh, not having that five foot radius. It drives me crazy in a lot of ways. But, you know, I, I have to understand that that's just how architecture was, you know, in, in, in the past. Um, but it's also probably the biggest renovation um, that, you know, people do face. And it's also uh, a lot of times it tends to be cost prohibitive for, for people. But I say it's one of the biggest investments, whether or not you have any kind of disease. If you're just renovating your house, that's that's the one thing you want to, you know, change. Um, and my the two Keiths, I see Keith Sr. here, too. So, um, you know, uh, they can they can chime in if they'd like to. I think one of the one of the biggest barriers, and I've 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 worked in the rehab space across the continuum and been in individuals' houses, and and we've made these recommendations. I think one of the biggest barriers in general is unlocking the value of it of the modifications and understanding the long term benefits. I think there's always that financial aspect, um, the sticker shock that we always get when something's a little more expensive. Um, but I've worked across 
the the barrier as far as when you have to move out and the cost is much greater and then you're in an unfamiliar environment. So I think once we understand when we can unlock the potential of our current home and understand this upfront investment can serve us long term, um, we understand the value of that accessibility. And so what we're working really towards is understanding how we can actually have our current environment adapt to our needs. And depending on what that cost is and making sure that's matching the individual. And so, you know, we're not building additions, but modifying the current space to meet those needs, not today, but for the whole future of our ability to stay and age in place um, and making sure that it is still valuable to the individual. And so when you see costs to move or costs to go into institutions, senior living communities or, or skilled nursing facilities, that cost far outweighs, you know, installing grab bars or, or widening doors in our current home. So um, I think that's the biggest barrier that sometimes we struggle with unlocking the value of our current home. I would agree. Uh, I know we want to be respectful of your time. So I want to thank everyone from the Prev AI team for joining us tonight. I think we learned a lot of options that we all have uh, given the, the progression and the different rates of these diseases. So thank you so much for the work that you do. And James, for your, your testimony of, of how just important this really is uh, from a day-to-day -day standpoint. Um, this is the next part of our of our webinar. It's it's our open forum. You're more than welcome to join us. You're by no means married to do so. Uh, we would love to have you though. I'm going to turn it over though, of course, to McFinn and.